Hello, good evening, everybody. Uh, Dr. To is tied up a little bit, so I'm just going to go ahead and start so we do not uh, lose much time. Um, it is my very greatest uh, honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Barbara Mason. Dr. Mason is the director of the Pearson Center for Alcoholism and uh, Addiction Research and is a tenure professor in the Department of Molecular Medicine at the Script Research Institute, La Jolla. So, uh, okay. Well, he said, go ahead. <laughs> uh, Dr. Mason holds the Pearson Family uh, Chair the Endowment uh, Endower Professorship in Alcohol and Addiction Research, and directs the program of NIH-funded research that including, uh, includes a multidisciplinary P60 alcohol research center entitled CNS Effect of Alcohol Cellular Neurobiology as well as to uh, handle the human laboratory study and the clinical trial of novel medic medication as potential uh, treatment for substance abuse disorders. Dr. Mason receives her bachelor's degree in fine arts from Sprague University, New York, and her PhD in clinical psychology from Long Island University, New York. Upon receiving her PhD, Dr. Mason went on to become a postdoc scientist at the Cornell Medical College in New York. Dr. Mason served as the center director for a translation, rat, non-human, primate, human, and NIDA funded P20 cannabis centers. Dr. Mason, Dr. Mason was a PI of uh, 15 years and NIAAA, National Institute of uh, Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, funded a translational project in collaboration with Dr. George Coop, who is our current NIAAA's uh, director, to develop a parallel animal and a human laboratory study of the portrayed uh, Amsterdam team to serve as a screen for potential therapeutic for alcohol use disorder. In addition, Dr. Mason is appointed as the overall PI of the 21-site 20, uh, USA clinical trial conducted in support of FDA approval upcam protest for a, uh, alcohol use disorder, provide experience with all stage of FDA review. Dr. Mason's um, contribution to the field of alcohol use disorder, including glucocorticoid receptor antagonism as a, a pharmaceutical target for the treatment of AUD, repurposing um, GAPA pectin as a novel treatment um, strategy for AUD, can process as a novel treatment for AUD, development of a neomethin, an alternative opiate receptor antagonist for treatment of AUD. Dr. Mason has received numerous awards throughout her career. Her work in medication uh, developed for the treatment of substance use disorder has been recognized with the Smither Distinguished Scientist Award from American Society of addition uh, medicine. Dean's Senior Clinical Research Award from the University of Miami School of Medicine and the Andrew Melton Foundation Teacher Scientist Award from Cornell University Medical uh, College. Dr. Mason conducted the similar studies identify neomartin as having therapeutic potential for alcohol dependence. Neomartin has since received regulatory approval for treatment of alcohol dependence in European Union of the United Kingdom. Uh, Dr. Mason has served on the National Advisory Council of the 
National Institute of Alcohol Use and Alcoholism, NIAAA, and the National Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA. He has served as a guest expert for the U.S. Federal Food and Drug Administration, FDA, and as a reviewer of the research grant for NIH and the Medical Research Council of the United Kingdom. Dr. Mason is an elected fellow of the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology and has served as a field editor for neuropsychopharmacology and as a member of multiple editorial boards. Um, today, Dr. Mason will be representing her work entitled Current Status and Innovative Strategy for Medication to Treat Alcohol Use Disorder. And before I uh, give the podium to Dr. Mason, I also want to welcome uh, Dr. Onivy from the William Patterson. She's a good friend with Dr. Um, Barbara Mason and family, and Dr. Jose Lopez back there. Dr. Lopez is the uh, academic position co-chair with me for many years. And okay, let's welcome Dr. Mason. Thank you so much, Suli, for that very thorough introduction. Uh, you, feel, you made me feel like I've done so much that I can retire. <laughs> well, it's uh, a true pleasure to be here. It was really great to see many of you at the poster session and to actually experience celebration of science that doesn't happen all that often. And so just want to acknowledge that it was a, a nice day. Um, also, one thing that Dr. Chang didn't mention is that you are looking at someone born and raised in New Jersey, so <laughs> that's why it's extra nice just to go back to Seton Hall. I actually met Suli when she was a reviewer of uh, the P60 Alcohol Center, which she's been for 20 years, and it's really wonderful to have that kind of history with someone who's watched your science evolve over time. And Tatiana, thank you for taking the time to write my, my biography for the poster for today's talk. So I began my career by being interested in, in alcohol. And I have circled back to alcohol and after, as Sully mentioned, um, looking at cannabis and nicotine and, and other um, substance use disorders. And the new CDC estimates of alcohol-related deaths are over 140,000 a year during the five years prior to the pandemic, with causes being primarily due to liver disease <clears throat> and other chronic medical conditions that are largely driven by alcohol, car crashes and accidents, and completed suicides. Alcohol misuse is estimated to cost the U.S. economy almost $250 billion a year due to lost work days, the cost of caring for the alcohol-related medical conditions, and law enforcement costs. Think about how much better that $300 billion a year could be spent if people weren't <clears throat> harming themselves and others with alcohol misuse. And what is of concern is many people really increased their alcohol use during the pandemic. You know, the, the pandemic was, is stressful there's the social isolation, job insecurity. You know, many, many factors contributed to a marked increase in alcohol use. And the current analysis of medical examiner uh, Beth attribution showed nearly a third uh, fold increase in alcohol related deaths relative to pre pandemic rates. And one thing I want to point out to you, this is not a raise <laughs> to 
what causes the most deaths, but every year, including the current, most current data, deaths due to alcohol outstrip any other substance. And in fact, in fact um, including opioids and fentanyl. Those are dramatic deaths, dramatic cause and effect. You know, you overdose and you're dead. But alcohol is so insidious. Those are half of all deaths due to liver disease are caused by alcohol, or car crashes. You know, it's like spread out. It's not blown <laughs> cause and effect. But the volume of mortality and morbidity attributed alcohol is uh, a curious drain. And what our alcohol center has focused on is the role of stress as a driver of alcohol use. And alcohol, a drink, will provide short-term relief from stress and the negative emotions that accompany it, like anxiety or dysphoria. And that moment of relief reinforces further alcohol use. But neuroadaptions occur to chronic heavy alcohol use so that that one drink <coughs> provides less relief and in fact, feel more stress when you're not drinking with these adaptions, creating increased vulnerability to even further alcohol use. And if you step back for a minute and think this pattern sounds familiar, think of, you know, intro to psych negative reinforcement, which is another element that the center focuses on, which is that you're drinking to relieve the misery of not drinking, not for the rewarding effects of alcohol. Fewer than 10% of Americans with alcohol use disorder get any treatment at all. This is from the facts about alcohol section on the NIAAA's website, which is bursting with information and facts. Fewer than 4% of patients with alcohol use disorder are prescribed an FDA approved medication to treat their alcohol use disorder. Drug development alcohol use disorder has largely been ignored by the big pharmaceutical companies um, and instead has been driven by grants from NIH to academic scientists like myself or done with in-house by NIAAA's own clinical investigations group or intramural research program. As the elephant said to his psychiatrist, I'm right there in the room and no one even acknowledged me. That's what it feels like sometimes um, in terms of the impact of alcohol on our society and the very little that we do to treat it. So <clears throat> there have been some important steps to change the situation. Um, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration has put a lot of resources in developing and implementing screening brief intervention and referral to treatment, a program for primary care providers that can really be used by any treatment provider. You screen with a quick question. For example, how many times in the past year have you had four or more drinks a day if you're a woman, five or more drinks a day if you're a man? Anybody raise their hands? Well, don't <laughs> because <laughs> Any answer greater than zero is considered a positive screen because four or more drinks a day for women, five or more drinks a day for men is the level of drinking that occurs within a few hours that's considered binge drinking that's associated with that high risk for accidents and untoward consequences. Another advance, oh, and so if a person screens positive, a brief intervention is to be provided and if follow-up shows that intervention wasn't successful, referral to treatment. And the Surgeon General, under Obama, Vic McMurthy, who is actually once again our Surgeon General under Biden, 
well, under Obama, he issued the first Surgeon General's Report on Alcohol, Drugs, and Health, and that was very important because that was the way alcohol wasn't being swept under the rug anymore. And the Surgeon General's Report recommends a chronic care management approach to alcohol use disorder, that when you go into your primary care physician and you're diagnosed with alcohol use disorder, notice made in the chart and all the different ways that alcohol impacts terms of your medical health, your psychological health, your relationships, your work performance, it's all documented. And a treatment plan is established. And so anytime you come in again, that is a diagnosis that will pop up and will require follow-up and a note in the chart about any side effects from medication. Are you complying with treatment? If not, why not? And are there any signs of relapse to drinking? Recommendation is to provide both evidence-based behavioral and the pharmacological treatment. Next advance was the American Psychiatric Association publishing their practice guideline for the pharmacological treatment of patients. And that provides evidence-based recommendations for appropriate prescribing of existing FDA-approved medications for alcohol use disorder as well as some repurposed medications. And by repurposed, I mean these are medications that are approved for other indications, but that scientists showed had efficacy for treating alcohol use disorder. And based on the weight of the evidence, the American Psychiatric Association decided that they would recommend that these drugs be included in their practice guidelines because they will never get FDA approved because they're in genetic, generic formulations, which means that no drug company will make any money off of doing the studies that are necessary for FDA approval for these generic medications that any company can produce at this point because they're off patent. And finally, now have subspecialty certifications in addiction medicine. This is very new, and in addiction psychiatry, which means we're building a cohort of physicians who are specialized in diagnosing and treating and using medications appropriately for alcohol use disorder. So, just so we're on the same page, Alcohol use disorder has been called by many other names, such as alcohol addiction, alcoholism, alcohol dependence, and they all basically refer to the same thing, a chronic relapsing disorder that involves compulsive alcohol seeking and drinking and loss of control over drinking, despite any negative consequences. Tolerance, which is the need to drink more and more to have the desired effect, and physiological withdrawal symptoms when alcohol is discontinued. But none of these diagnostic systems talk about the protracted withdrawal syndrome that motivates people to relapse. It doesn't have the somatic symptoms of acute alcohol withdrawal when alcohol is being metabolized and clearing the system. Those symptoms are somatic and physical, like high pulse rate and blood pressure, sweating, tremor. These are emotional symptoms that we call negative affective symptoms, like anxiety, dysphoria, Every clinician knows them, knows you're going to see them when a person, you know, a chronic heavy drinker stops drinking. But nobody says anything about that either. And this is the part of the alcohol cycle that our group is particularly interested in. So I kind of put the human condition in this outer ring. You have the chronic heavy drinking, the acute withdrawal, which peaks in about two days after the last. And you have, whoops, this period of protracted withdrawal, starting with your negative affective symptoms, sleep disturbance, getting into craving, and then boom, you're back to relapsing to heavy drinking. And this clinical cycle maps on to the cycle that's been identified and 
studied by the basic scientists in our center, where when you stop drinking, the stress systems that are located primarily in the extended amygdala become overactive and start spewing out these peptides like corticotropin releasing factor, dinorphin, glucocorticoids, hypocretin, vasopressin, um, which contribute to the feeling of negative affect, drives the negative affect. Also, as I'm sure you know, Dr. Chang is very interested and influential in the area of alcohol's neuroinflammatory effects. I put this under the withdrawal negative affect uh, grouping as well because it too is associated with some of the malaise uh, similar to protracted withdrawal. And likewise, peptides. Also, uh, by the time a person gets to this phase of the cycle, they're anti-stress systems have become depleted so that you have less resilience. Um, what's very important about discovering and identifying all of these different systems is that you can easily manipulate them pharmacologically. Agonists can block these bad boys who make you feel so anxious and irritable and dysphoric and know that if you just had a drink, everything would be all better. Um, and likewise, I hate to be simplistic, but agonists can be used to shore up the activity of brain anti-stress systems and oxytocin agonists, for example, have been studied in proof of concept way and people with alcohol use disorder. And I'm going to show you some of our work uh, with antagonists uh, of brain stress systems and also had a good result with um, an anti-inflammatory agent that works on the neuroimmune effects of alcohol. But in terms of our currently FDA approved drugs, they we have three of them. We have disulfiram and naltrexone, which interrupt the binge intoxication phase. Disulfiram makes you very sick if you drink, and so it's considered a deterrent to drinking. Now, truxone binds to the mu receptor, which is part of your reward system. So the thinking is that it, alcohol is a when a reward is impaired with the behavior. In fact, a lot of the clinical trials have shown that people do drink less on naltrexone. They may not become completely abstinent, but they will drink less. And then the third drug is a camprosy, and that acts by normalizing the overactivation in the glutamate system. It restores the balance between the excitatory and inhibitory systems, primary glutamate and GABA. So it actually acts on returning to normal um, an element that becomes dysregulated, specifically in alcohol use disorder. And just to fill in the rest of the picture here, when the stress system becomes so overactivated in early withdrawal, it really impacts the ability of the prefrontal cortex to control responses to um, the stress response. And alcohol itself um, negatively impacts uh, the function of the prefrontal cortex, which is involved in your ability to inhibit complex information. You, know, you think over and over again, and I work with people with alcohol use disorder, and it's like, he had such a nice family and such a good job, how could he continue? Sorry. Anyway, um, disulfiram, as I said, was the first medication approved 
for the treatment of AED. It was approved in 1951. That's like even before the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism was formed. Um, and as I said, it inhibits the metabolism of alcohol so that a byproduct, acetaldehyde, will quickly build up with a rapid onset of flushing, nausea, and palpitations. And it really doesn't do anything in the brain. It doesn't change the brain in a way. It simply, and medication compliance in the general population tends to be poor. You really have to be selective. Uh, really have to have people who want to quit drinking entirely and really who have a partner who will observe them taking it every day. It should never be given to someone in a state of alcohol intoxication because it will make them horribly sick or without their full knowledge. <coughs> and the molecule itself has some effects on the negative effects on the liver, as does alcohol. So you have to make sure that you have a relatively healthy liver uh, before you give it and track the liver while people are on it. But I will say there are some people who want to be on disulfiram because it's the only thing that will keep them from drinking. People who have a lot on the line will lose their license or whatever will elect to do this because very bad consequences. So I'm not knocking it. You know, there are many routes to recovery. Naltrexone is a pure mute opioid receptor antagonist. As I mentioned, the hypothesis is if alcohol consumption is less rewarding, drinking will decrease. Trials have borne that out. It was originally developed in 1984 for opioid addiction, um, but people with opioid use disorder prefer the opioid substitution or agonist drugs like methadone. Um, and it just kind of sat on the shelf for 10 years, and then Joe Volpicelli at Penn noticed that he did a clinical trial, which was replicated by Stephanie O'Malley at Yale. And on the basis of those two um, investigator-initiated trials, the FDA gave a new approval to naltrexone for the treatment of alcohol use disorder. There are some compliance problems with this drug, too. Some people um, with side effects, which do tend to resemble a mild opioid withdrawal syndrome, nausea, headache, et cetera because you are blocking the body's own endogenous opioid receptor. Uh, to offset the compliance problems, the once monthly extended release intramuscular injection uh, formulation was developed. Rather expensive and requires special handling, refrigeration, et cetera. But again, for some people, this is the only option. The LPR M1 uh, gene of identifying people who because it is so selective for the mu receptor. Why not look at, you know, genetic polymorphisms and see if you get someone? But this, you know, you get a positive result and then it's not replicated. So, you know, we're not quite there yet, but it's tantalizing. Um, the caveat with this is basically that, you know, a person can't be using illicit or prescribed opiates because they'll go into opiate withdrawal, you know, when you treat their alcohol with naltrexone because it's a mu receptor antagonist. It blocks the mu receptor and doesn't know whether it's blocking it for alcohol or opiates. So you have to do the job of making sure that it's just alcohol that's involved and not And this molecule also, by itself, has a little bit of But what Jovo Pacelli showed was that the effect of alcohol on the liver is so impactful that even using naltrexone 
results in improved liver functioning by reducing the effect of alcohol on the liver. I hope I've made that clear. <laughs> but, um, so, acamprosate is the third FDA-approved drug. It's the, they're all taken by mouth except the injectable. It has a lot of advantages. It does uh, restore balance to that excitatory system uh, that's associated with craving. Um, abstinence in studies that have been up to a year Duration. It also normalizes alcohol-related sleep disturbances. Um, some very cool uh, pharmacometabotropic um, studies have been done at the Mayo Clinic uh, showing that serum glutamate levels at baseline predict response, uh, which is pretty exciting. Uh, also done a back check and shown that responder showed glutamate levels at the end of treatment relative to non-responders. So the serum have some traction as a way of identifying a subgroup of people likely to respond. Another uh, thing that's an advantage for people with alcohol use disorder is that acamprosate's not metabolized in the liver. It's excreted through the kidney. People with uh, liver disease. Like, what's the catch? <laughs> well, uh, it has poor bioavailability, so you have to take two capsules three times a day to get the, you know, the full benefit. Um, some people don't like that, but you know, you put them in a pill tray with the day and time of day the dose is to be taken, and you know, best. So, the APA practice guidelines suggest using a camprosate or naltrexone. They're equally uh, effective. In patients who wish to cut down or quit drinking, prefer medication, or have not responded to non-pharmacological treatments and have no medical contraindication to their use. The APA recommends disulfum generally not be considered a first-line treatment given the potential risk of severe reactions and, you know, the your consequences if somebody drinks while taking it. And the evidence for a camprosate naltrexone is scientifically more robust because the evidence for <laughs> to have approval in 51. Um, they do point out, this is, keep this thought in mind, that antidepressant medication and benzodiazepines should not be used for the treatment of alcohol use disorder unless there is a concurrent disorder for which these medications are not indicated for the treatment of alcohol use disorder and they're, they're ironically overprescribed for alcohol use disorder and the real medications to treat alcohol use disorder are, under, are underprescribed so go figure um, benzodiazepines are the treatment of choice for acute alcohol withdrawal. Um, and not be continued beyond that five day risk period of acute withdrawal. There's a drug, Namafine, that Sully mentioned. Oh, Sully also mentioned, I'll just circle back to that for a minute, that um, I was the overall principal investigator for the a camprosate study that was conducted for FDA approval. And that was actually very interesting to see what the FDA approval process was like from start to finish. And our lab was also the first to identify that namofine had therapeutic potential for Namofine was actually developed by the same chemist who developed naltrexone and considered it as new improved uh, naltrexone because it binds, um, Sully was discharged. <laughs> it binds more competitively to um, mu, delta, and kappa receptors. Um, and what's interesting about that is, um, so 
the mu receptor, as I mentioned, is part of the reward system. Kappa, part of the misery system, um, it releases, it binds, dynorphin is uh, what binds to the kappa receptor, and that's one of the misery compounds that was in the left-hand panel of the brain slide. And so when you block the pleasure of drinking and the misery of not drinking, functionally, you get the effect of a partial agonist, which is the sweet spot, I think, pharmacologically for murder. So that you're not just going bulk, you know, bare drinking, but you're also relieving some of the anxiety, dysphoria, irritability, sleep disturbance, not drinking. It's also taken in a different way. It's, it's given in conjunction with very strict behavioral counseling and monitoring so that you can actually pull this off. It's taken one to two hours prior to anticipated. And it's been shown to decrease heavy drinking and studies up to one year. And European Medicine Agency, now approved in many countries around the world, they used a two-level reduction in the World Health Organization treatment. outcomes that they assess. And you're limited in terms of what you can measure on a clinical trial because some of these health consequences only occur, thank thankfully, you know, many years in between, like alcohol-related motor vehicle accidents. So in looking at the enormous WHO database, they found that a two-level reduction in their risk levels of drinking were associated with improved mental and physical health and quality of life. So there are a lot of benefits associated with, you know, rigorous drinking reduction outcomes that you can measure on a clinical trial. What's important to keep in mind about medications to treat alcohol use disorder They've all been shown to have better drinking outcomes with counseling than placebo with counseling. In all the studies, medications to treat alcohol use disorder, everyone gets evidence-based behavioral counseling so that you can show the medication has an advantage above and beyond standard treatment. And they're to be used as part of a comprehensive treatment plan based on a chronic care model as outlined by the Surgeon General's report. They're a treatment, just like behavioral counseling is. They are not a cure. And, you know, I hate the way drugs get so overpromised, like, you know, new cure for alcoholism every time a new molecule shows promise. And, you know, people get kind of desensitized after a certain point. To so I think you have to build this context. You know, they're a tool in the toolbox. Um, not treatments for alcohol withdrawal, as I mentioned, that has its own special treatment, gold standard being benzodiazepines. None of these are alcohol substitution drugs the way methadone is for, for heroin. They're not addictive or habit forming. You don't need increasing doses to get the desired effect. The situation of the medication doesn't precipitate rebound drinking or craving. They don't induce euphoria. <coughs> They have absolutely no street value as illicit drugs. But, you know, there's three, every one has their limitations. So, as I mentioned, there's an interest in developing future medications. So what do we want? We want small molecules that can cross the blood-brain barrier and target those parts of the brain that we want them to. The FDA has had to have granted an investigational new drug uh, application acted favorably on it saying that they've reviewed the chemistry, manufacturing, um, all the pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic properties of the drug, the preclinical testing, and must have the IND to do 
would prefer it to not have abuse potential, to not interact with alcohol such that you have more impairment of alertness or motor coordination if a person drinks while taking a medication by alcohol alone. We'd like them to have a good safety profile and not have the have toxicity, the negative effects of the earlier medications. We'd like them to have good tolerability so that people don't discontinue treatment and have a good acceptability in terms of the route of administration and how often you have to take it. In terms of what you have to do to get FDA approval, you have to really be very basic. You have to count the number of drinks that a person has while they're taking the medication versus placebo medication. And each of the drinks in this picture contain the same amount of pure alcohol with a can of beer being equal to uh, an ounce and a half of, or a shot of distilled spirits being equal to five ounces of wine. And standardized data collection methods for daily number of Find that self-report with biochemical measures because there really is no definitive way to uh, estimate how much a person is drinking other than what they tell you and what their body tells you. But a breathalyzer only tells you if a person's been drinking within a few hours of the breathalyzer reading. Alcohol glucuronide in the urine can go tell you if a person's been drinking 80 hours. Uh, prior to the collection. These are really our best specific measures of alcohol in the system. But then there are non-specific measures, GGT being the most commonly used because you can get it at LabCorp. It's a measure of a lizard, liver enzyme that's most impacted by heavy drinking. And so um, that's often used as a objective confirmatory outcome. There are smartphone apps for real-time drinking data collection and a non-invasive transdermal wrist alcohol sensor that just looks like a Apple Watch. But these are in developmental stages, close, but um, they're not available uh, to the general public or in a way that can be used for clinical trials. FDA clinical trials. And to get a drug approved, this is why nobody wants to pay for generic formulations getting approved, you have to have two positive randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials, multi-center. told you the Camper State one involved 21 sites in the four quadrants of the U.S. Six months of treatment given in conjunction with behavioral counseling outcome measures that the FDA likes are the rates of no drinking over this treatment period or no heavy drinking. And heavy drinking is defined as four or more standard drinks a day in women, five or more a day in men. So that's a lot of work. <laughs> the Akemper State study had 601 subjects and 21 sites all over the country, six months of treatment, and then bring all those data and analyzing many millions of dollars. So my colleague George Koo and I were interested in streamlining the process and moving those molecules those through uh, antagonists for those stress neuropeptides and seeing if they had efficacy. For example, alcohol use disorder, you know, like a, a quick and not dirty screen, but you know, basic, not a full clinical trial. And so and George provided a systematic preclinical evaluation of the most promising small mo molecules. And I provided clinical proof of concept testing. And we were particularly interested at molecules that we thought would restore neurocircuitry change neurology of alcohol use disorder to within a homeostatic or normal range of functioning. So in other words, to block the recruitment of those brain stress systems by enforcement and provide a powerful motivation to remove the kind of the back and forth that we had. Um, 
I had to identify either drugs or get access to investigational drugs that had an IND, and George could stick anything in a cannula and make it that brain, but we'd go back and forth between our models and identify candidates for later phase clinical my model basically involved recruiting non-treatment-seeking males and females with active alcohol use disorder prior to testing. Testing involved affective priming for and then in vivo exposure to alcohol, which is an external factor for relapse. This is primary element where the subjects preferred alcoholic beverage or the control presented in a random order for 90 seconds after each mood condition. You're just told to view it and smell the beverage for 90 seconds and not drink it. And having served as a guinea pig to train people times, I will tell you 90 seconds can be a long time. <laughs> and, smell. and then on a big, large, flat screen in front of them, one question would come up. How strong is your craving to drink alcohol? Like, right now. And they click the mouse on a, on a, not at all, it's extremely strong. Then the next question would come up. If I could drink alcohol now, I would drink it. It'd be hard to turn down a drink right now. Having a drink would make me. Factor analysis. Want it quick. Thing. You are not using <laughs> the limbic system. You're using higher order functions by the time you get to question number 30. So gabapentin was the first drug that we tried out in this situation that we created. It was available because it was ready FDA approved for alcohol and pain. It did it with modulation of GABAergic activity via action on voltage gated calcium channels. And GABA is and um, it was of interest to me because it was widely used off label to treat symptoms accidents and risk depression, anxiety, insomnia have all been studied with this drug. Very widely prescribed in the U.S. for neuropathic pain. And like a campersate, it's not metabolized in the liver and has a very nice safety profile, but also like a campersate, it has low bioavailability and you have to take it. So Marissa Roberto in our group, in our center, showed that it acted much like a CRF antagonist in terms of effect on, on GABA release in the central nucleus of the opposite uh, relationship to GABA than, than you intuitively think. Um, it's where GABA is a bad thing. <laughs> she showed that it uh, decreased antagonist did. And in dependent and non-dependent rats, she showed that gabapentin in the dependent rats dose dependently reduced lever pressing for alcohol and had no effect on the non-dependent rats regardless of the dose you gave. So that suggests that it is actually doing something related to the condition of alcohol dependence. These are alcohol dependent rats. In fact, so we randomized the non-treatment seeking volunteers with alcohol use disorder to seven days of treatment with 100, with 1,200 milligrams a day of gabapentin prior to their curie activity session and found a significant reduction in the strength of craving, the impulse to drink, feelings of loss of control over the impulse to drink. And we also found significant improvement in sleep efficiency, which is the amount time you spend in bed actually sleeping 
versus lying there counting sheep. We found a significant improvement in sleep latency, which is the amount of time it takes to fall asleep, and a very significant improvement in sleep quality. And we had no daytime grogginess the next day or, you know. So then we next did a full-scale clinical trial where we randomized 150 treatment-seeking outpatients with alcohol use disorder to 12 weeks of abstinence-oriented counseling, and they were randomized to either placebo or the lowest and highest FDA-approved doses of gabapentin. And we found significant linear dose effects on the rate of complete abstinence with the 1,800 milligram group by far having a higher rate of complete abstinence than placebo with 900, the low dose being in between. Same with the rate of no heavy drinking. Uh, where nearly half or half the uh, subjects treated with the highest dose of gabapentin had no heavy drinking at all on the study. And that's the level of drinking that's associated And number needed to treat is an outcome measure the FDA likes. That's why they like these categorical outcomes that are yes or no. You either did it or you didn't. <laughs> and it tells you the number of people needed to treat to get that perfect result. And it was eight for being treated with um, the highest dose and being completely abstinent for the study, and five for the people being treated with the highest dose not having any heavy drinking. And these are remarkably great, big outcomes. Like if you read the number needed to treat for like 20, 27 or something like that, I mean, who wants to be number 25 or 26, you know, and with that level of hardness about outcome. So anyway, um, the 1800 milligram group also so the greatest benefit on the Beck depression inventory and symptoms of dysphoria on the big alcohol craving questionnaire and on the Pittsburgh sleep quality index, which is the outcome I showed you earlier. So to summarize, gabapentin dose dependently significantly improve rates of complete abstinence and no heavy drinking and the quantity and frequency of drinking the results are backed up by GTT that liver enzymes sensitive to alcohol it also positively affected um, alcohol craving, sleep disturbance, and negative affective symptoms. Well tolerated with no serious or unexpected drug-related adverse events or evidence of abuse potential. It does not interact with alcohol. However, drugs in this class may be abused by opiate addicts and withdrawal, recreational prescription drug abusers, or prisoners. And in clinical trials, like when you're doing first clinical trials with a population, you exclude people with other conditions because you want to get a very clean look at what it does for the disorder you're indicated, you're, you're studying. But, you know, in life, people are complicated and they have multiple conditions. So you have to watch out for people in these situations if they're saying they've lost their medication frequently or are using much higher than prescribed doses, they would not be good candidates for continued treatment. At this point, about 1,000 people have been studied in clinical trials of gabapentin for alcohol use disorder and have been absolutely no signal for abuse potential in that very clean population. Um, so as a result of work done by our group and others, um, the AP included gabapentin in its practice guidelines for the pharmacological treatment of patients with alcohol use disorder, which is great because this is one of those generic drugs that would never have financing for FDA. Quickly, I'm going to just tell you about, am I okay with time? Um, oh, that's plenty. So mifepristone is another drug that um, we studied in this back and forth model. And this kind of targets the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Um, heavy alcohol use drives corticotropin releasing factor in the extended amygdala. Uh, as a matter of fact, see, this is a graph to be a big driver of the misery that 
not shrinking and it serves powerfully in the negative reinforcement. And mifepristone is a glucocorticoid progesterone receptor antagonist. It's available for repurposing because it's FDA approved for chronic treatment in patients with Cushing syndrome. Clinically, we hypothesized that administering mifepristone in alcohol use disorder following acute withdrawal might normalize the HPA axis sera dysregulation and thereby protect against relapse during protracted withdrawal. Um, the cortisol response is blunted with chronic cycles of heavy use, withdrawal, et cetera. And when you have that blunted cortisol response, it doesn't oppose the overexpression of sera. If you amp up the cortisol response, it tells sera, okay, we got it, you can turn off now. And um, that's the hypothesized mechanism of action. So in these rat studies, rats that were made dependent on alcohol showed a linear dose reduction uh, with mifepristone. Whereas, again, in the non-dependent rats, there was no effect of increasing doses of mifepristone, just like in the Manhattan. Port 113176 is a pure glucocorticoid antagonist, and that showed the same linear dose reduction effect in dependent animals effect in the non-dependent. And it's not on a slide, but looking at a pure progesterone antagonist, it had no effect at all in dependent or, and no effect in dependent animals, suggesting that the effect for alcohol use disorder is antagonist action. So, we randomized people to a week of treatment with 600 milligrams of mifepristone and found a significantly lower response to the alcohol cues. And what was also interesting is we found a significant on drug and was sustained at one week post-treatment follow-up. We also found a significant reduction, this is in GPP, the enzyme sensitive to alcohol, but we also got a significant increase in the cortisol levels, um, this is just before the first dose of mifepristone, and this is after the last dose uh, over the that cortisol levels uh, increased fivefold with that week of treatment, and then just kind of over time. And despite all that action under the hood, <laughs> um, people had very few side effects um, with the drug relative to placebo. Um, you know, there, was, there were no severe or unexpected adverse events. So to conclude, the clinical studies of gabapentin and mifepristone both showed reductions in craving, drinking, and liver values relative to placebo, suggesting that these drugs have therapeutic potential for AMP. Both well tolerated, no concerns about safety, abuse potential, um, following drug discontinuation. We provided clinical validation of the preclinical study showing these drugs reduced reinstatement of alcohol seeking and intake. Remember, we're like a multidisciplinary center, so we're always looking for, you know, cross-validation of models. And, you know, these drugs, and certainly we have the evidence with gabapentin, may reduce the negative affect and insomnia of early abstinence, thereby increase compliance with treatment. But I think the meta message is that these findings lend role to lend support to the role of drugs that target abstinence-related dysregulation and brain stress systems for the treatment of So there are many, many potential drug candidates in this domain. Well, I think the future looks bright, um, despite us being a little slow out of the box <laughs> in terms of drug development. And I want to end by just calling your attention to this resource that's available online, the NIAAA Treatment Navigator. 
which can help you um, learn about treatment options and identify treatment providers in your neighborhood who can provide both pharmacological and behavioral. Doesn't work unless you use it, so um, happy to take any questions. On it. Thank you. Yes, Tatiana. <laughs> Um, I think that um, there's been a lot of interest in looking at, um, if I can get, oh, I'll just, there is really, a lot of interest in this area. Um, unfortunately, a person studied CRF antagonists in a peculiar way. You know, this is, CRF is part of the stress response, right? It's part of the misery of happens, like it starts becoming over-released, you know, This person kept people on an inpatient unit for three weeks, starting them on drug, and they had gotten, you know, lots of TLC at that point and were not feeling like a great deal of stress. And it was like not a great time <laughs> or model for testing this. So that was kind of disappointing, and we didn't get a difference from placebo. And so that's kind of been put aside. But you could see with the mifepristone results, which is another way of getting at CRF, you know, using cortisol to turn off, you know, the question of CRF, um, you know, that was another way of getting at it. The, there is an investigational kappa opioid receptor that's being studied for alcohol use disorder. Uh, there's uh, studies of the hypocretin one and two receptor antagonists. Um, there's a positive multi-center trial of vasopressin antagonists. So, you know, I would say uh, antagonists for the brain stress response. Also, varenicline, which is a partial nictinic receptor antagonist, um, effective in a multi-center trial of alcohol use disorder whether or not people were smoking were smokers okay so that's like another drug in this domain so I see a lot of action in this domain much less action in the anti uh, Or these, no, or, okay. Uh, these are weeks of study, and no problem. You know, in a clinical trial, bumps can occur for all kinds of reasons, like, um, you know, we're talking about a two-point difference basically accounting for the spike. You know, it, it's, uh, it's not a clinically significant change, but um, like in the cannabis study that I did, it's like, wow, the sleep disturbance just was gone at eight weeks. And it was because 
the people with sleep disturbance just dropped out at that point. So they didn't have the data to show that the sleep disturbance was persisting. So these are, that's a very good question. And you know, you, that's why it's important to have control of your data so you can look at you know, these anomalous findings and understand them. And, and I guess this one didn't like really call out to me, but um, the sleep one in, in the cannabis study definitely did because it was so dramatic. And when we looked, it was like, wow, dropouts <laughs> accounted for the change in the data trends. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you this so everybody can hear. You had mentioned in the clinical trial they had to be sober for the three days before starting on the drug or placebo. So was it difficult to find people who could stay sober for those three days? Uh, um, our first experience was in human laboratory studies, and people were very businesslike. They were getting paid to stay sober <laughs> for three days. And the alcohol glucuronide, urine dipstick confirmed you know, that they did do what they were supposed to do. We also collect the alcohol glucuronide in um, all of our clinical trials. And you know, those are more motivated because they're treatment seekers. And um, so we actually don't have that big a problem saying that we had, on April 14th, we finished a human laboratory study of the selective glucocorticoid antagonist, son of mifepristone. And the last patient subject drank, <laughs> so we couldn't include them. We didn't, we didn't even run them on the Q-testing because, um, you know, such a violation of the protocol, and they wouldn't have the same responsivity to alcohol cues for the, either the drug or the placebo to affect or not affect. But so that was one example of somebody very recently who did drink. But that's really the exception rather than the rule. And I would say most people um, with an alcohol use disorder, I mean, we pull entirely from community dwelling individuals, you know, so. They're still functioning in the community, which puts them at the mid-range of alcohol use disorder, and they can hold their breath for three days. But you know, when you get into the higher levels of severity, which is what many people see in treatment settings, you know, then I'm sure it would be much more challenging. Yes. Have you checked the brain uh, clock genes effect on alcoholism? and uh, whether melatonin treatment can be a potential treatment strategy for uh, AUDs? The brain clock genes, uh, you have mentioned about the orexins. Uh, clock gene, biological clock genes, like uh, the, which causes the sleep disturbances. I'm asking about the clock genes, like orexin. Orexin is fascinating. I have to say, it, I call it hypocretin because it was actually discovered by Floyd Bloom, the founder of our alcohol center, and he's the one who named it hypocretin. And so I make everybody in the center call it hypocretin. But the, we have a lot of French speakers in our center, and they just can't pronounce it, and they really hate it. But we do it to honor Floyd. <laughs> so <laughs> to me, it'll be, always be hypocretin. Um, so hypocretin is really interesting and has been showing some very intriguing benefits for both opioid um, use disorder as well as alcohol use disorder in the rat. Uh, I just, uh, well, no, actually, I have in progress a, a study, a human laboratory study for alcohol. Um, it's midway, so I can't tell you anything. But I found the, the preclinical work to be absolutely fascinating because 
hypocretin co-regulates dynorphin. They have, uh, I mean, it, they work together to amplify your misery. <laughs> so um, I, I told Remy, the guy in our group who studies this, that when he comes up with a medication that combines an orexin antagonist with a kappa antagonist and a CRF antagonist, I'll take it. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm there. <laughs> I actually know a drug developer who took a CRF antagonist, and he said that he, it made him feel just wonderfully normal, you know, like just on a good day. I thought that was interesting because you get so little information about what these drugs do and how they make you feel. So, and. CRF antagonists are all investigational, so you wouldn't know unless somebody took it and told you. So that was their experience. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Well, we thank uh, Dr. Mason for the wonderful lecture, but I also like to acknowledge our provost actually join us. Uh, thank you for Dr. Pasanini to uh, come all the way from the uh, Fahey Hall to join us. Okay, I have two things I wanna bring up. You know, I'm gonna be really straight with this because we've had a fun-filled afternoon here, but um, I just want to, uh, first is acknowledgements. And the first I wanna acknowledge um, our guest speaker today, Dr. Mason, we have this uh, gift for you. And it says, in appreciation for your participation in the 14th annual Biological Sciences Symposium. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. So. Okay, and then really quickly, I just want to thank Dr. Chang for all the arrangement that she made to um, have Dr. Mason come here to visit us from California, um, setting all that up. Um, I also want to thank um, uh, Dr. Zhao, who gave us our opening remarks. I want to thank everybody who helped me set up out there. Um, uh, without it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. Also, thank you to the judges who are judging this thing. And then thank, of course, thank everybody else for coming here tonight. Second thing I want to bring up is the results, the results of the poster judging. So for those of you um, poster presenters who are still here, um, I'm gonna start with the undergraduates first and then I'll go to the graduates. So for the undergrad category, third place, and I apologize if I mispronounce anyone's name, but third place, Jake Minnis. Second place, it's uh, all in one poster. This is uh, Shivani Patel, Monica Vlodarsky, and Emily Arellano. And first place, first place for the undergrad, Radha, um, all one poster, Radha Patel, Harmon Gill, and Richa Patel. Good job, good job. All right, and then for our graduate category, Third place, Brian Rice. Good job, Brian. Second place, Matthew Gregory. And first place was a tie. Two posters. One by Ayuni Yosef. Ayuni, are you here? And the second tie for first place was a poster by Catherine Lefferts and Pooja Shah. All right, so thank you all for coming tonight and um, enjoy the rest of your evening, and the rest of your semester. Take care.